So I'm really excited having all of you on here on stage uh, in our panel. I think we have a very great diversity here. Uh, so let me start with the first question. Actually, back to, to you, uh, Isaac. If you don't mind, we'll have a bit of a rest. But I'm really interested to understand. Uh, by the way, I, I'm going to ask the panel questions, of course. And, uh, and I'll address the question to any particular of you. But the question, happy to have feedback from everybody, of course. And uh, I will definitely leave time at the end for questions for the audience. So please write down the questions. We definitely gonna gonna have time for you all to ask them. So uh, back to you, Isaac. Uh, IoT security complexities. Uh, we, you know, we talked about the different the, the birth of of cybersecurity and the different names that it uh, over time got. And what I want to especially interested in, how, what do you see are the key complexities in moving from protecting computers to internet and to machine to machine. So M to M is another new term. What is the real complexity that you see in that, 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 that movement? Because with 25 years, we all worked on protecting information. Now it's about protecting physical as you described. First of all, there's a question of numbers. I mean, numbers by themselves are important. And when we speak today about internet users, we speak about few billions, okay? When we speak about uh, internet of things, it's, it's at least 10 times bigger. And uh, numbers make it very complex. Secondly, it becomes in a way out of control. The so internet providers are not so many. And um, if government is uh, taking regulation seriously, it can do a lot in uh, reducing the risks, okay? It's almost impossible to do it with the Internet of Things. It's like trying to, to control the free market, and, which is, of course, impossible. Um, and thirdly, uh, the level of damage is different. I mean. It's terrible when you, someone is uh, stealing your credit card number or, or stealing money from a bank. But no bank really collapsed until today from stealing money from a the bank. They earn enough. Uh, when it comes to physical damage, it's, it's a different story. Different story. No one will live without electricity. <coughs> or if trains will start to uh, uh, um, t today, trains are driven by trains are also things, and they are driven by by computers, not driven by drivers. And and the computer software takes care uh, of uh, t uh, avoiding collisions. But let's say these things will start to collide. It's it's a different story. So anyone else, uh, special complexities in the move to machine to machine, particularly? OK, great. So I think you know wh what is the most talked about in the last week or so worldwide is the Apple versus FBI saga. And I think that's a really interesting uh, story, especially as, uh, as you mentioned, Professor, that Cybersecurity is not just technology. Technology solutions are there. It has legal implication. It has ethical implication, and, and so forth, so on. What's your take on it? Should the government be able to force device manufacturers to weaken security in order to get access to data it seeks by authorities? I'm pretty passionate about this. Um, I've got an Aussie accent. I'm actually American as well, so I can speak on behalf of yeah. Um, th there's a real big issue here that the governments, um, Obama's been walking a very uh, a tightrope for a while now on, on security, um, wavering one way or the other. He's now gone firmly to the FBI's camp. Um, and there's a, there's a real problem we've got here. The, governments, the government is saying right now in the US, it's, it's um, saying it's like heroin. This, let, let, let me have just one taste of it. Let me just get that one phone. Um, that they're chasing down right now, right? This is, this is their, their argument. Of course, it won't be just one phone. 
It'll be the second phone, the third phone, and then it'll be your phone eventually. So this is a real, this is a real problem we're facing in Silicon Valley, um, and it's, um, it's going to be um, somewhat of a war between those on the side of privacy and, and maintaining your privacy, because if, if we give, if Apple gives the FBI access, then the Chinese and the Russians and the Korean, North Koreans and whoever else and the bad guys will have the same access, right? So this is a big deal. Um, you know, and the, we're, we're faced with um, politicians like our president, I'm talking about President Trump here, who, uh, <laughs> who uh, uh, incidentally won another two uh, states t this today, but um, he, uh, he called for boycotting Apple on this issue, immediately thereafter tweeted on his iPhone. So you know, this is the kind of craziness that we've got going on in the US at the moment coming from the government side. So, so I know I, I, I'm hoping that most people in this room at least would look at this as, a, as a, a very serious issue that they need to actually stand up and be counted before the government gets hold of your iPhone. If I may, um, well, the tension between security and privacy is, is obvious, okay? Uh, one doesn't go so well with the other. Okay? But this is an old tension. It's not cyber, it's not, it didn't start with cyber technology. I mean, we all give up some of our rights and expect the government and pay taxes to the government, expect the government to give us security in terms of police or in terms of external threats. And we don't have a local neighborhood Air Force or the city infantry or something like this. It's an old tension. Usually we solve this tension uh, by experience. I mean, you have to balance between two important values. Both of them are important. You cannot sacrifice the one for the other. And only experience will tell you where is the right balance, okay? In this cyber uh, new era, we don't have this experience. That's why we argue intensively because we cannot rely on, on the past and, and our experience because it's in you. And sometimes common sense helps. And so let me tell you the way I see it on a common sense uh, basis, okay? It's the government, the United States government, that, uh, they did until Snowden exposed it, they did uh, um, violate the privacy of people uh, in order to increase the security, okay? This is what the NSA did. And this is, at least according to my common sense, this is wrong. You shouldn't do this, okay? And also the American took one step back once it was exposed. It is, it's a different thing to go after the criminals, after the bad guys. The government doesn't ask Apple to give it uh, now for, for now on the, the keys to the encryption, et cetera, et cetera. They speak about a certain group which uh, by, by an order of a, of a court, and this is usually what we do in our life. I mean, we don't want the police to stay, I don't want the police to, to stay in my house. I don't want to see policemen in my house. But once there is a break to my house or something like this, I want the police to come and get the bad guys. It's, it's a simple common sense. And I think that what Apple did, if Snowden is reliable, okay? What Apple did before, and they did before, they let the NSA some backdoors to their uh, um, uh, iPhones, was wrong. And they're still wrong now when they, uh, uh, as perhaps as a lesson, as a wrong lesson of what happened in the past, they uh, uh, don't want to help the government catch or, or bring evidence, supply evidence uh, for the deeds of a group that uh, uh, is really, I mean, uh, by, by the order of court. Yeah. In both cases, they were wrong. Still, I, I, ju I just want to make a comment on that before we move on to the next one. I did a lot of research on that issue, actually, and uh, one of the mis misinformation or misunderstanding is that it's not about Apple giving you know, the information of the FBI or who actually is behind the, the, the crime. It's about Apple 
compromising the security of the platform, then if they do that, it will compromise the security from now moving forward. That's one issue. Why? Because that, that, that's the way they, they can't, today Apple can't actually get, well, can't get into that phone. They need to write special software and s do certain things to actually be able to break down the phone that will expose it then from, from the f from for the future. That's one issue, and maybe I'm wrong, but that's what I read. The second thing, the second thing, <laughs> that's okay. I'm sure, I'm sure it, dep it depends who you ask, yeah. but uh, that, that's okay. And the second thing is that, you know, obviously Apple is uh, still an American company, although everything is manufactured probably in China. Uh, think about the Samsung and all the other companies, Chinese companies, that, uh, that will then be able to, to compromise or, or have an excuse to compromise their platform. So every phone we have, we then can basically be controlled by, by someone sitting in Beijing or somebody sitting in Russia or whoever. Uh, because that, that platform security is not as robust as Apple is trying to do that. So I might be wrong, but this is basically some argument of, of, of some people. Anyway, moving on, a uh, question for you, Chris. Uh, so you and KPMG obviously have a lot of corporate clients uh, that are looking forward to implement IoT to increase their efficiency, to productivity, uh, and have better uh, financial outcome. Uh, and the question is really around the awareness. Uh, we understand the lack of consumer awareness to the risk of IoT products and services and lack of manufacturers as well. So I'm sure Jeep did not envision that their you know, car will be exposed to that kind of a hacking. Uh, so increase of awareness will basically uh, uh, drive adoption uh, much faster and the question how do you think uh, we can uh, increase the awareness, uh, both on consumers, but particularly on the uh, companies that are looking to implement our mm -hmm. team? Okay, good, good question. I, I think, um, I, I'd say generally speaking, corporate and government have a limited awareness of IoT in, in Australia. I think both in terms of what it means from an opportunity for them, <clears throat> uh, what what the potential risks are if they attempt to adopt it and don't do it well, but possibly moreover, what the potential disruptions are caused by others who are adopting it well. Um, so I, 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 that's kind of my, my baseline position. I'd say that you know gen generally limited awareness, um, and. You know, I think any awareness that's out there is probably just latent awareness of, of executives having a, a Fitbit or a connected thermostat or something like that. They might think of it in a consumer landscape, but are they really thinking about what it might mean to them as a as an insurer, as a banker, as a farmer, or, or whatever they may be? I think that's that's pretty limited. So I think um, obviously forums like this are, are critically important. I think uh, we've got the I can see Frank over there. We've got the IoT Alliance of Australia which is getting some momentum. I encourage you all to get involved if you're uh, passionate about IoT. Uh, we're looking to establish that as the kind of preeminent body within Australia to help influence policy and raise awareness and help foster an active ecosystem around IoT. Because there's opportunity for us to be a great consumer of IoT and be a world leader in adopting and applying IoT to drive real business value. But I think there's also an opportunity for us to be a creator of technology, which we've, we've not done that well in the last 30 or 40 years. So, look, I, it's not an easy answer to, to, to uh, not an easy question to answer. I tend, I think we've got a role in, in organisations like KPMG. People are probably thinking, KPMG, why, why does KPMG care about IoT? Um, it, it's, I mean, it, it is going to disrupt every single industry uh, fundamentally. I'm convinced of that. It's at the top of the hype cycle, so I still think we've got a ways to go. I think awareness and trust are the two things that will make it happen um, more quickly and get the time to, to revenue that you talked about. Uh, with trust, underpinning trust is, as I said, <coughs> privacy, safety and security. So we need to make sure those things are there. So the board director, uh, the, the chief risk officer, the C-suite will be thinking, yes, I see the opportunity here. They tend to think of things in three lenses, cost, risk, and growth. So will this help me cut cost? Will this help me drive growth? 
Uh, will this help me mitigate risk or will this introduce risk? So all of those lenses. So I think it's things like the IoT Alliance, it's, uh, it's organisations like us helping to broker connections between the startup community, the IoT technical ecosystem and the business and the government community. Uh, but, and that's a journey. And I think as a, as a country, we're probably two or three years behind most other countries, is my personal opinion. I might just say that um, to, to echo Chris's comments, um, through our cybersecurity review, um, that's absolutely concurrent. That you know the awareness um, level is quite low, um, and that I think that that risk proposition is something that um, seems to have the lowest understanding. And for those in the audience that have um, experience in risk management and the concepts around it, of course, one of the things that um, I feel is, is lacking most, particularly in uh, you know, technology and also cyber security, is the concept of positive risk and how to engage with positive risk. Because of course, actually in layman's terms, that means opportunity. Um, because uh, I think that it might have been um, Antonio that mentioned shared risk. Shared risk is kind of the hybrid in between and it depends on where you're sitting in the ecosystem as to whether or not that shared risk is a positive or a negative for you. Um, these are concepts that actually senior executives are dealing with every day. They're just in more traditional worlds. So actually getting, finding that, that sort of sweet spot, as people say, it's, it's using examples that really capture their imagination around actually IoT, of course, is a risk. It's a risk because it's a disruptor, but absolutely um, that can be overwhelmingly positive. Um, and really, again, um, some of the messaging that you'll probably hear a lot from me today is around... Um, there's nobody in this room that's under the age of 18, I don't think. Is anybody under the age of 18? I'm certainly not. Um, we've got a whole generation of people coming up behind us that this is the norm for them. They don't know any different. And we're making decisions on their behalf at the moment. So when do they, when they, by the time they get to become senior executives, what does the world look like for them? So I think that's a really interesting prospect talking about IoT and data security. Thank you. Uh, back to you, Antonio. Actually, question around, so we touched about it, you just about already, but uh, I've been to CES uh, a few months ago, and uh, there was CES actually took, looked more like a Detroit car show than CES. So all the car manufacturing were there with the fancy demos and, uh, and prototype. And uh, so there was a lot of session around uh, uh, car, autonomous car, self-driving car, and and a lot about the insurance aspect of it. And uh, really what, uh, what, what was, uh, what stricken me is that all the companies, car companies, were putting the liability over to the driver or the consumers or the owner of the car. There's one company that did differently, it's actually Volvo. So Volvo, which built the brand around safety, is, is taking the stand that we are actually liable, we are the responsible for what happening with the, with the with self-driving car. How do you think, Antonio, this will play out eventually? Uh, do you have some thought about how it's gonna be in a year or two in terms of who is taking the responsibility? This is a very good, uh, very, very good question and there is not yet uh, a clear answer. The point is that uh, normally uh, I don't know very well Australia, but uh, this is true for US and for Europe. Uh, normally, the liability on a service is taken or assigned uh, legally to who provide the service. Uh, if uh, a car manufacturer uh, provides uh, a car engine, he has a, um, a warranty that is a basically an insurance on the functioning of the devices uh, provided, while the driving behavior is in the hands of the owner of the car. If the driving behavior moves to the car manufacturer to a certain extent, uh, there will be for sure at least a sharing uh, of liability, where uh, the boundary between uh, the liability of the owner that is basically connected to misuse of the device that is provided and the liability of a manufacturer that is responsible for the quality of a service uh, is a little bit foggy in this moment because the 
there is no jurisdiction and not clear interpretation what means uh, misuse of an automated device. And this is true for cars, but it's true also for, uh, for, uh, for drones, for uh, any kind of uh, automated, uh, automated, uh, automated device. There is no, not a clear definition of a misuse, but that the liability of a malfunctioning, uh, of a hackering, of a software flow for uh, an automated device, whatever it is, car or whatever else, uh, is uh, on the manufacturer's side. This is not very questionable. That's... Uh, Yeah, this is go, uh, I mean, I believe that uh, going forward there will be less and less uh, liability on the personal side. Uh, everywhere, home, work, uh, car, whatever, and uh, increase uh, in a more complicated, uh, uh, on a more complicated uh, professional, uh, professional liability. Said this, uh, uh, this complexity will be probably compensated uh, by a better functioning uh, uh, and better management uh, of risk. I mean, the reason, the real reason, and I truly believe this, uh, Internet of Things is unstoppable, is uh, because in general, the level of safety, the level of comfort, the level of control on uh, unknown variables in our life uh, will be lower. So overall, risk decreasing, compensated by a uh, higher complexity in managing and understanding it. Uh, even when we talk about uh, data security, it's a problem we have to deal, but uh, it's not that the data security is enabling the Internet of Things. I believe, maybe I'm wrong, but um, it's my opinion, that the Internet of Things is unstoppable because it's a growth and improvement of the services we are using, and uh, data security is a collateral that we have to deal with uh, because it comes with it. Excellent. So I think what we'll see basically is uh, more liability going from an incident or an accident to, to liability around cybersecurity. So the companies are not going to be on the guard properly to protect the hacking of their systems. That's another whole set of liabilities they're getting exposed to, which we weren't before. Before you had a car, you didn't worry as a, as a Ford about cybersecurity. Now you really worry about that. So moving on to the next question, Cameron. Uh, so as, as, as we all hear, really, uh, it's about IoT and, uh, and, and funding of IoT and how we can accelerate the development and, and, and through funding of IoT companies. Uh, with IoT taking center stage, every technology event and, 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 tendency, and tendency of VCs to jump on the trend of the day. So we know that VCs, every few years, they have the darling, and they're all flocking to invest in the same space. Uh, how do you see that VC differentiating themselves to attract the best IoT companies, startups? I don't get the bit about uh, we're all investing in the same stuff, Aitan. What are you talking about? Anyone got Uber for something out there that they can uh, share with me after the <laughs> event? Um, Look, I think we're, we're in a phase, um, you know, if you look back 20 years ago, um, the, it was all about the internet, um, and then we went to a period of mobile, and everyone was talking about mobile, and of course each of those broke down into various sectors and regions and every, diced every which way from an investor point of view. IoT is the same, in my opinion. Right now, it's, um, everybody's talking about it. It's one of the hot sectors. Um, that uh, VCs are raising capital in, in fact, I'm one of them. Um, but eventually, um, or, or sooner rather than later, I'll break down to the, the, to the obvious sectors um, that you know, it'll, it may evolve around, for example, agriculture and IoT or aircraft or, or you know, there'll be very, very uh, specific niches that, that VCs are going to be going after. Um, you know, I like what we heard today, and um, I think this is a really, this is a sector, cyber security, any security um, that we're talking about right now is, is 
a continuing thing that VCs are going to be investing in and it's a sector that I'm going to be very, very focused on because I think this is where, um, you know, obviously we can make money as VCs, but we've also, um, you know, there's going to be some pretty big challenges coming up and to the extent that anybody in the room can solve them, um, you're on the way to um, being an Uber for something if you can solve these issues that we're facing right now. Right. I have lots of more questions, but maybe it's time to open up to the audience. Uh, how much time do we still have, Santa? Okay. Oh, we have a bit more, but any question? <coughs> yes, yes, Ian. Well, they all work on commercializing it. I mean, uh, the, the goal of developing these computers is to make money at the end of the day. And therefore, they all work on commercializing it. I don't think, and, I, I, and, and it goes hand in hand. I mean, uh, today you cannot take a building, seven stores building, and move it from one place to another place to do something, I don't know what. Uh, you can use it only for uh, 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 perhaps uh, uh, like like we use today. If you take the example of of what you used to call supercomputers, okay, or high power computers. High power computers uh, for years were considered to be an asset that is controlled by governments, okay. Um, Israel, for example, Israel is not, uh, didn't sign the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, for good reasons. And therefore, we are not allowed to buy in the, in the market. This is, it goes with the NPT. Not allowed to buy supercomputers. Now, the definition of supercomputer changes every half a year. What nowadays is a super, uh, what nowadays is a simple computer Five years ago, was considered supercomputer. By the way, although we cannot buy it, some 56% of the supercomputers in the list of the top 500 are produced in Israel. So this is a different uh, story. Uh, perhaps because we are not allowed to buy it. <laughs> but, but government didn't want uh, uh, to sell freely supercomputers because people can, this, it, this, this was the perception, people can use it to develop nuclear weapons, which is not um, uh, a good thing to do generally, and because uh, as intelligence services use them to crack um, uh, sophisticated codes, uh, encryption. But once it, the computers became uh, small enough, cheap enough, no one can stop it. I mean, today, there's no, I mean, the, the ban on supercomputers is artificial. It's artificial. Anyone can have at least the supercomputers that were considered supercomputers two years ago. Okay, there is a small uh, delay, that's all. And the same will happen with, uh, with quantum computers. At the beginning, only several governments will hold it and use it for intelligence and things like this, mainly for, for uh, decryption, because the faster computer you have, then uh, it's easier to, by try and error, to find the, the key. And, and once it will be cheap enough and, and small enough, 
no one will resist the temptation to, even space went through this until uh, 15 years ago, space was controlled entirely by government. I'm speaking now about uh, observation satellites, okay? And uh, the United States government didn't allow commercial uh, companies to sell images taken from space. When it became cheap enough, satellites became cheap enough, uh, uh, um, uh, simple enough, they couldn't resist it. And now they keep, every few years, they, they say, okay, you are allowed to sell images with no better resolution than it started with two and a half meters, now it's, it's 40 centimeters. And it's going down every year or so. The same will happen with so uh, quantum computers. There's another thing, contrary to what I said, in quantum computer technology is very much um, related to what we call quantum encryption. It's a different story. It's the same technology, same principle, principle of, of entanglement. There are ways to encrypt information using quantum devices that are in principle unbreakable, cannot be really decrypted. In principle, and this is this goes with the same technology. So, the issue I think the issue of uh, intelligence and encryption and decryption will will cancel itself in a way. Okay. Yeah. Next question. Uh, well, I, maybe get, just get the mic. Well, I guess related to what you've been talking about, I think there's a, a bit of an elephant in the room. Uh, we're making. One thing one cannot do is really predicting the future. This is, this is a kind of a play of a game. We play, we, we, we play it. We try to predict the future and usually we are wrong. Okay? So it will be a very bad advice to avoid doing something or because we think that the future implications will be, I don't know what. Uh, it's, it cannot really be done, I think. If you take seriously, and, and uh, I know some people that take it seriously, what will be the implications of uh, 10 to the 30 uh, more computer power? It will, it, it, it will have other implications, not related at all to Internet of Things, but it, it may threaten the uh, human being themselves. I mean, you know, robots can be more intelligent than human beings, and this is, this is a serious issue. What, what can you do with it? You cannot really say today, okay, we stop doing whatever we do because there is a danger like this. And the same, the same with your remark to my uh, analysis. I don't think we can stop technology. We cannot go backwards to Middle Ages. This is not the question. The question is, we should take certain aspects from the beginning in designing our future technology. I mean, we cannot stop it, but we can take some aspects more seriously from the, de from the design phase. Okay. Yes, Simon. saying is that when commercially developed goods grow, people are wanting to 
cut corners. They actually want to say, well, this is it's just a subtext. And that's something that's not really important on its own necessarily. But when you link it up to, well, I guess just the general fact that, then we're, that we are instrumenting the entire, like we are instrumenting the entire, entire planet that we live on, um, there are things that are unforeseen exactly, uh, you know, like you go before where you've got the, um, you know, if you hit the air conditioning, so and that's actually an example, right? It's just that, it's just an air conditioning. Yeah, yeah. Well, what can you do with an air conditioning? Yeah. Well, maybe you can change the temperature and affect something else and areas like that. So I guess it's just um, something that we're seeing on the, uh, at the grassroots level in terms of local development. Um, people are cutting corners. They are. Um, and a lot of those corners that are cut um, are often in their own, perhaps fine. Like it is just one tip brush. But it's when you tie them all together at the high level in terms of when you can map that with that and that and then you have some kind of you know, profound impact somewhere else. I just wanted to share that and, and just ask what your thoughts were that grassroots reality? I, I think from a corporate perspective, I would say if you're talking about in a corporate, I think that's a cultural issue. And as the saying goes, the, the fish rots from the head. So it's got to start at the top. So the board has got to believe that it's a critical issue and they've got to be propagating it down. So I just happened to read a report this morning, which was the top 10 priorities for boards this year, and number three was cyber security. So I think that's where the, the awareness comes. So it's you know a culture of risk, it's a culture of cyber security, it's a culture of innovation. So that, that would be a perspective from, from the board that, 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 that will hopefully change over time. Because if the board and the C-suite are not thinking about it, if it's not a priority for them, it won't be a priority for anybody else. And it will be, it's just a, let's get on with it. All right, thanks. All right, last question <coughs> at the back there. Just one sir. My question is around a national policy on the internet, internet of things. Uh, is there any sort of um, move underway to do that at a governmental level? What would be the elements required to underpin that? I heard the word trust mentioned earlier. Do we have a trust in the whole economy and trust in buying these things? using them and driving the whole industry, what role would cyber security play in, in that? What el other elements would there be apart from cyber security? What things need to work together to have a national um, policy to drive the economic opportunity of IoT? And are there actually any moves underway already? Just to finish that, I've noticed that in the news recently, there's been a big the news attack in a couple of states in India have now got um, policies the United States government, I believe, the Senate there is driving the need for a, a national policy. Do you think there's a need for one in Australia or should it be commercially based? Yeah. Next question from Michelle. Okay, I guess that's me. Uh, <laughs> so um, I guess, again, that comes down to some of the cultural aspects and, and uh, a bit like um, I'm a, an impassioned risk manager. I'm also very passionate about culture. Um, in Australia, we obviously, I mean, we're, we're, su we're surviving on a legacy in Australia of a culture that is she'll be right. Uh, so that's actually one of those factors that's ingrained in the way that we do things in Australia. Um, I think what we have seen over the past maybe five to ten years in the policy space is a recognition that actually, that's not enough anymore. Um, if we actually want to derive benefit in this country rather than seeing it exported overseas is that um, we actually have to get a lot smarter about this stuff. So we, we are absolutely thinking about this and actually um, one of the, the remarks that I didn't have time to, to speak to the folks before this started is that actually what we talk about in government now, um, and it's not just because we have a Prime Minister who is very aware of these things, uh, we actually do speak about it in terms of Internet of Everything because that's exactly what it is. And to talk about it conceptually as though it's out there about to come at us because humans are, are really dreadful at um, you know, doing stuff beforehand. We're, we're pretty rubbish at prevention, right? Um, if we think about our personal lives and then extrapolate that out across to the national and global levels, we're, we're pretty rubbish at it um, overall. There are exceptions to the rule, of course. But um, the internet of everything, as it's already been pointed out, is here. It is here. I don't wear a Fitbit because I work in a national security environment and I'm not allowed to. But most other people actually do have some kind of device that's like a Fitbit. And as we heard, that data's being sold 
hopefully anonymised, <laughs> um, for, for benefit in other ways. And there's some really great benefits there. Um, but at the end of the day, um, we do have a history in Australia of solving some policy problems by letting them run through a little bit. It goes to the professor's point about experience. In, um, in new areas, uh, we traditionally aren't that great at developing policy, um, you know, sort of just before or just in time, if that makes sense. Uh, but on this issue, we absolutely are thinking about it. You'll see some stuff in the coming months around this. Uh, and what we have to look at, of course, at the government level, and I know this is going to sound really boring, but it's actually quite important, um, is that we have to look at the connections around a policy on the internet of everything against how the, the government positions itself to drive economic growth around things like cloud. So the government's policy on cloud is a really good example of where we've actually seen a divergence between levels of government in Australia, and I'm sure it happens in other jurisdictions too in other countries, where we've got some of the states and territories in Australia that have gone very ahead very differently to the Commonwealth, and that's all perfectly fine, but at the end of the day, um, in a Western democracy, uh, that can send some really odd messages to the market. So when it comes to Internet of Everything, because we know that it's here to stay, it's actually our new world and it's right here, right now, um, we do take a little bit of extra time, as much as it frustrates everyone, to make sure that we've thought about some of the implications, whether they be positive or negative, about the ripple effect of such a policy. Um, sometimes, you know, the technology actually outpaces us in doing that, um, but not always. And I'm hoping in this space that we can actually really make, make some, some advances in a way that we actually leapfrog some of the things that we've not been so good at before. But thank you for your question, it's a great one. Can I, can I build on that just with my um, IoT Alliance Exec Council hat on? So I think the short answer is, is yes. Um, the word policy makes me a little bit nervous because often when we think of policy, we think of rules and regulations. And I think we need to get the balance right of fostering innovation and advancement and development and learning and experimentation without overloading rules into a space where we really don't know what's going to happen, what's going to work, where things are going to be commercial benefit obtained. I think the, the we absolutely need government leadership and active involvement in fostering IoT. If I look to the UK, I think they're doing a far better job. of actually just come from the UK uh, last week. They're doing a far, far better job of fostering IoT, in particular in the, in the smart city space. But they're also working hand in hand with the technology ecosystem to get the balance right, to drive innovation, work out where rule, rules need to be built, where standards need to, need to be created. But they're actively playing a role which encourages the technologists to get involved and innovate and develop. So we've got to get that, that balance right. And kind of from an IT alliance, we're actually in the process of putting together a position paper to go to government, expressing some of our views on behalf of the technology community of what we think we need the government to be doing, to be thinking about IoT and not, not missing the wave. Sure. Thanks, Chris. So just before we finish, uh, that was great uh, input from all of you. I have one last question. Pass the mic between everyone. Maybe start with Michelle. But uh, fair to, to believe that it's going to get worse before it's going to get better. And really, what I'm interested to, in your thoughts or prediction, what will be the number one biggest breach of security in the next couple of years? So just pick up one possible. What do you think that will be? I love doing the black swan stuff as a risk person. Um, Look, I think that um, I think it's actually in the internet of everything. I actually think that um, the big one will be when we actually really have the layperson on the street actually figuring out that all of that connection that happens between the devices in the internet of everything um, just goes boom, 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 bang. And you know, I actually think that some of that started to happen, but because the lack of understanding and awareness in the community writ large around this stuff is so low. Um, and it hasn't had necessarily a physical impact on a lot of people, there's not that consciousness about it. Um, but I actually, yeah, I do think it's in this space. Uh, Sonia, what do you think it could be? Plane crash, the car accident? Uh, no, I'm, uh, the thing that makes me worry, uh, it's uh, the equilibrium of the overall financial, financial system. I mean, whatever we do, we can manage any risk as far as we have resources uh, to face and confront this risk. Uh, what worries me more than a specific breach uh, is, uh, I was talking with Cameron the other day, is the current low suite uh, that we have with Target. 
in the United States. Target got a, a big breach of security and all is a big retailer for who doesn't know one of the biggest one and basically all the credit cards that they had in file were hacked and copied but what huh? I was affected by it an Australian yeah I was affected by that yeah the, the, no, no, the physical I was in Hawaii at the time that it happened no, <laughs> <laughs> no however what I what uh, what I want to say that the physical damage I mean the money that was actually stolen by the credit card uh, it, it's not existent. I mean, there was just information that was taken out by some uh, joker hacker that uh, said, I got all the credit cards and whatever, but didn't use. So in this moment, uh, there is a class action against Target that uh, tried to quantify uh, damage, uh, a loss recognition for the stress of having the credit card uh, number stolen. So not uh, are the cost of reinstatement of a credit card or the cost of reimbursing uh, eventual theft. Uh, the system financially can support uh, any physical or real damage, but the system cannot uh, support uh, or uh, cybersecurity coverages and protection if the cybersecurity breach uh, is over uh, evaluated. So what really worries me uh, no, the, the, the financial system, I mean the ecosystem, uh, government, uh, the money that is available in the world uh, is not sufficient to cover the cybersecurity risk. So no matter what cybersecurity breach you will have, uh, if we go in this direction, uh, it can become complicated. Right. So it's a risk to the global economic structure. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm a horrible gambler. Um, I, I'd say in the next couple of years it's probably more of the targets. I don't know that there's going to be anything catastrophic or big from a critical infrastructure, things that move. I think that's maybe four or five years away, I think, based on adoption, but I think it's a matter of time, given the bad guys out there and more and more things getting connected, critical infrastructure, trains, transport, electricity grids, but I, I'm guessing that's probably four or five years away before that's hitting us. Every time there is a new phenomenon, new risk, uh, some people take it seriously, some people say no, it's a hype, it's uh, going to, to um, pass away, etc. Uh, <coughs> I still remember how we, we I mean the Israelis, we complained because we, when, whenever we wanted to fly, we had to go through such a security check that uh, the whole world uh, was laughing at us. Okay. Today, I miss this, this old security check. But uh, today, uh, I always say it's, 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 we are very lucky that this guy hide the explosives in his shoes and not in his uh, underwear. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't know what will happen. But, and now there is a standard. Sometimes it is standard, sometimes it's passed away. Unfortunately, in the case of cyber security, I am very pessimistic. Because as I said, it's, it comes with the computers. And I don't know even one person in the world that thinks that computers are, is, is a passing phenomenon. It's not like this. There are going to be more than uh, there are today and in places that we don't, even in our bodies even in our bodies. And therefore, cyber security is not something that is going to, to go away. Yep. Um, I think we're likely to see some terrorism act. Um, the bad guys will get in, whether it's into our phones or our electricity grid. Um, something will happen. Um, and hopefully, it'll wake a lot of people up, because a lot of people sit around today and don't, don't imagine it's going to happen to them. But when it does, and they get affected, then it'll, you know, people will take this topic pretty seriously. So I suspect that'll be the, the turning point. All right, with that optimistic view, <laughs> uh, let, let, let me thank the fabulous panel. Thank you very much, it was very insightful. <laughs>